Hi guys, this is Nils Grandelius uh, making another uh, candidate recap for uh, Lichas. Today round uh, 13 was played and it was quite a, a dramatic round and not not the least a very important round for the for the final standings in the tournament. Uh, the main games today of course were in the top 5 between uh, Grishuk and Giri, with Giri being half a point behind Nepo and uh, and also Nepo of course against MBL. Uh, but let's have a look at what I think maybe is the best uh, play today. Uh, so it's uh, Grishuk against Giri. Uh, Grishuk starts with d4 as he has done uh, for the most of the tournament. Uh, Giri of course knows all, all theory there is in the world. Uh, he can play anything because he knows everything. Decides, quite surprisingly, to play the move b6 here. I mean, to play the Queen's Indian. Uh, which is an interesting choice, I thought, during... Because he's he's half point behind Nepo. But it's not clear how many points Nepo would score in the last two rounds. So, I mean, uh, the difference between a win and a draw, of course, is big. But the difference between a draw and a loss is also actually quite big. Uh... And b6, in my opinion, uh, it signals that he is somewhere in between. He wants to take a bit more risk than usual. I mean, if he wants a draw, he could have taken played the Queen's Gambit and tried to be very solid, for instance, or the Ragosin or whatever. Uh, but with b6, he wants to take some risk. He wants to get Grishuk a bit out of book. Uh, and not the least, try to get Grishuk to think a bit. Uh, but he does not want to do anything completely crazy. He does not, for instance, play the Benoni or... You know, even worse, some Boom Blumenfeld Gambit or whatever. Uh, he wants somewhere in between, uh, what, uh, in between the two approaches of solidness and uh, a lot of risk. Uh, and after a couple of moves were made, uh, he gave the check on b4. And here again, if you want to be incredibly solid, you take on d2. And this is uh, uh, this is very solid, but also uh, uh, not really playing for a win with black. So he chose to move c5. Uh, with the point that after the capture, the pawn structure is a little bit uh, imbalanced. Yes, he does take away from the center, but the pawn on b4 is quite uh, quite annoying for white actually, because it stops, for instance, the knight's most natural square, c3. And also, actually, uh, long term, it can be quite uh, quite nice to have such a far advanced pawn. And uh, and this structure is, I I think, quite a reasonable choice from from Geary, uh in the sort of risk sense of view, because it is uh, imbalanced. It is uh, sort of uh, uh, giving him some long-term possibilities to play for the win. Uh, but uh, it's also not going all out, and uh, I mean, it's not uh, directly unsound. The only problem, as we would see, is that uh, that Grishuk is playing these kind of strategic... Uh, strategically imbalanced uh, but rather positional fights like very very well and in this game I have to say that he was really playing very well so castles castles was normal knight bd2 here sometimes they play setups with d5 but in general d6 is a little bit more uh, uh, to the point because you later want to push e5 and uh, play on the dark squares uh, queen b3 a5 and now for this line a very typical move which for instance, when I saw this line for the first time, uh, I thought that in general white should try only to play in the center and on the king side because black is taken away from the center, so white has some edge there. But in actual fact, what Grishuk does with a3 has in practice become, I think, the main uh, the main line. And the point is simply that it is not that easy for, for black to react because if black were to take, white would take back with the a pawn, actually. Uh, and... The thing is that the pawn on b6 uh, is uh, is very weak. So let's say we would put the black, black a pawn back to a7, then black would even be better here, I think. Just very, uh, very nice Nimsu Indian kind of position. You would go knight c6, knight a5, the pawn on c4 would be a little bit weak. And it would be very nice. But here it's, it's a completely different story because the pawn on a5 uh, does stop the knight from going to a5 from where it would put pressure on c4, but also the pawn on b6 is a bit weak. So... This is not such a great uh, structure for black, therefore Aguirre decides to play knight a6. But now uh, Grishuk plays one of the main plans in this uh, position, uh, which is to bring a knight 
specifically the F3 knight, to attack the pawn on B4 in order to force black to capture on A3. Uh, but there are a lot of nuances and move orders. And after some thought, Grishuk started with rook FD1, which I think is not the most usual way, and probably took Giri a little bit out of uh, out of his concrete prep. But in general, my guess is that Giri was not preparing this very much move by move. He just wanted to play the position and uh, he thought it would give him a game and then uh, like he would see what happens uh, over the board. Uh, knight e1, as said, uh, the point is to uh, to attack before. Bishop takes g2, king takes g2. Obviously, because the knight should not go in that direction, it should go to d3 or c2. And now, it's not so easy for Giri here because uh, white will attack before, and if black does nothing, then the pawn will be captured. And if it takes, then this pawn on b6 is slightly weak. So there, some counterplay needs to be found. And usually in this line, it's connected with the uh, uh, with the move e5 and play in the center. But in this specific position, uh, Giri played in a very sort of modern modern way with h5. Uh, the point being that white is moving everything towards the queen side, so therefore there will be some potential for counterplay against the white king, which could be a little bit uh, naked here. Uh, the only problem is that, or, or the basic problem is that white does still possess more control in the center, and generally speaking, in order to attack on the flank, uh, it's very, uh, it's not very frequent that it works if you do not have control over the center, because much easier to move the pieces back and forth for for the one who has more space. Uh, knight c2, and yeah, as I said, the, they're like I move like h4. White would just take on b4, so the counterplay is uh, for such drastic measures not enough. Therefore, he had to take on a3. B takes a3. Uh, rook a b8 to protect the pawn on b6. And now, I mean, white is not really able to immediately. Uh, attack the pawn on b6, so it's not weak in the sense that it's about to fall, it's just never really possible to push it to b5 and therefore it's going to stay on b6 uh, needing in need of protection for a very long time. So Grishuk very naturally changes to central play now that he has achieved what he wants on the queen, uh, queen side. e5, queen d3, uh, knight c7, rook a b1 and somewhere around here it's not so easy to uh, uh, to pinpoint the exact uh, moment uh, where things go seriously wrong for for anish here uh, but generally speaking white is trying to uh, just uh, bring stuff towards the center the move knight e3 either to f5 or to d5 Maybe safeguard the pawn on e4 in order to be able to move the d2 knight, opening the d file for some pressure and put some pressure on the b6 pawn. And so white has a lot of these sort of slow uh, moves, increasing pressure bit by bit. And uh, well, for black it's about finding finding some concrete counterplay, maybe connected to, to playing h4 at some moment. Try maybe to get the pawn even to h3, maybe by a queen e6 or queen d7. Or, or something like that. Uh, but in the game, Anish does not really find uh, the best way, and it seems to me that he's from, from this moment on starting to uh, to drift slightly, because, okay, he played knight e6, which is very natural. It stops knight e3, because the pawn on d4 is hanging. But after uh, rook b5, uh, rook f8, in itself uh, a decent move. Now, it's not possible to, or it's uh, at least not uh, very uh, tempting to take the pawn on e5 because it would leave, uh, uh, I mean, white very sort of uncoordinated, let's say, if we take, take, even the ending with knight c5 is, I think, not so bad, but also something like rook d8 or even the other rook to d8, and there is problems on the d file, there is uh, a sort of general lack of coordination for, for white, but... Uh, uh, Grishuk played h4, and also in general, like for Grishuk, it's about stabilizing and, and building slowly. And if he is, uh, so, I mean, if he's allowed to build, uh, he should not get sort of distracted by uh, 
by trying to take a pawn that black uh, would be happy to give. So h4 makes a lot of sense. It stops the counterplay. And here's here I think this g6 followed by knight d7 is... Uh, I mean, it seems to me uh, a little bit slow. I don't know if... I mean, g5 is a bit maybe too much, but uh, something a bit uh, a bit quicker than, than this. Because knight d7, now knight f1 is a very good maneuver. And... Uh, after, yeah, the problem is that the knight is coming to d5 and it will increase pressure and black needs to do something. So Geary decides to take. And here, uh, yeah, here after knight e5, I mean, it's not obligatory to play knight e5, but it's the logical follow up of, of, of taking on d4. Uh, queen e2, knight takes d4, rook takes d4. The problem is that c4 is very easily protected. And uh, the pawns on d6 and b6 are, are uh, harder to protect and lot more of a long-term issue. And additionally, the, the knight, when it comes to d5, will also create some threats towards the black king because of the f6 square. So particularly this g6 move, I think, was not really serving any great purpose. Knight c6, rook d1, and yeah... Maybe it's possible to, uh, I mean, it's for sure possible to defend a bit better here, but it's definitely a very unpleasant position and not what Giri wanted for this game. So, uh, yeah, queen d2. Now, I mean, just to stand and defend this pawn passively will not uh, hold in the long run. With G Grishuk a little bit low on time, Giri decides to play f5, which, I mean, it simply doesn't work. It's, it's a calculated risk, but... Uh, a risk born out of necessity rather than uh, uh, rather than some uh, <coughs> sort of serious attempt to uh, to get counterplay because after takes knight c6 i mean this was fancy it takes a five probably not necessary but i mean something like this would be uh, completely losing for black it's it's a p it's a piece but it's uh, mating threats there is also rook takes h5 and Queen e2, king h3 is one check, and uh, black is not really going to uh, to escape this at all. Uh, it's simply mate in, in very few moves. So he played, uh, he took back on f5, and uh, the ending is just two pawns up, and not particularly interesting. So the, uh, the, the sort of strategic imbalance did not really pay up for Geary, but it was... I think a relatively fair try, and uh, I mean, all, all credit to Grishak for handling the situation so well. Uh, the other game, which was, of course, very important for the top, uh, was the game Nepo against MBL. Uh, Nepo, very interestingly, decides to play knight f3, because if e4, c5, these Sicilian positions are very well suited for our MBL to play for the win, even though the risk is also much bigger to lose, but at least there are winning chances. So knight f3... Is trying to be very solid. Knight f6, c4, and here MVL decided to play with b6, which I think he does very, very rarely. Uh, but he's basically just trying to get a position that is not uh, prepared by Nepo this day. Uh, and for this reason, also the move g6, something like e6, I mean, Queen's Indian or even Hedgehog would be well prepared by Nepo for sure, so try to imbalance. Here, the point with the black setup is after knight c3, there is knight e4. So you manage to trade the knights, and then you can follow up with c5, and the pawn on d4 is a bit weak, and the bishop is actually quite hard to, to kick out from e4. So that's why d5 is played, in order to play knight c3 without knight e4 being a possibility. Uh, knight a6, knight c3, knight c5, short castle, short castle. And here, white is trying to push e4. Uh, the old main line was knight d4 in order to open up for the bishop. But after e5, black gets some counterplay. For instance, knight b3, d6 is a position that has been played uh, even by myself, but more prominently by, by guys like Dubov, for instance. And it seems like black is not doing so poorly. But what Nepo does is more ambitious, queen c2, to go e4 without allowing this counter e5. And here, I think MVL was really not... Uh, anymore in book, had to uh, try to be as inspired as possible. Uh, and, uh, well, instead of trying to sort of play e6 or uh, or maybe c6, try to attack the center, liquidate. 
he decided to play slower to keep the tension a bit longer. But this a5, in my opinion, is uh, is a little bit too slow because it, it allows white to consolidate the center, which Nepo does very nicely with rook d1. Now, both e6 and c6 would be a worse version. So knight e8 was tried by MVL. Uh, and this, uh, I mean, this is very, very provocative. Nothing uh, that you really, I mean, cannot really be recommended. Certainly not something that MVL would play in... Uh, uh, in a game where he didn't really need to, uh, to create a lot of winning chances. Like, if it was a normal game, he would never play a5 followed by knight e8, or probably also not the line in general. Uh, the problem is that after uh, bishop f1, knight d6, b3, it's very, very hard for uh, for black to, uh, to get out. And, I mean, the knights, they are looking pretty, but... I mean, apart from maybe stopping e4, I, they are not really doing that much, and it's quite easy for uh, for White just to play around it. And uh, Nepo does this in in, so, in quite a nice way. Uh, I mean, the basic problem for Black is uh, the lack of a, of a sensible pawn push. Uh, I mean, MVL is trying with Rook E8, uh, trying to get E5 in, which if he does, would still not help that much, but it would be at least some some counterplay. But bishop e5 was quite uh, a nice solution by, by Nepo, trading the bishops and stopping e5. Now e6 takes takes. And here uh, there are many ways to play, but Nepo is playing this part of the game, I think, in a very uh, logical and uh, straightforward fashion. He simply goes rook a b1, playing, trying to play a3 b4 in order to kick the knight away. Uh, MVL plays e5 in order to play this sort of King's Indian uh, style position. He wants to play e5, he wants to play f5, he wants to push on the king side. Uh, and firstly, he might threaten e4, e3, or that's at least his intention. It is possible to allow it, play e3, a3, uh, e4, knight d4, and after e3, then the move f4 is uh, just also very, very convincing for white, but Nepo is playing even more solid with knight d2. Just stopping any any e4, e3s. Uh, and after f5, continues with the plan a3. Queen f6, b4. And, uh, well, black does not really have any choice. Has to take and go back to a6. And now, uh, I mean, the knight, if it was somewhere on the king side, let's say on g4 or even h5 maybe, somewhere there it would be some counterplay and it would be... Uh, a decent position for black, despite the bishop being being uh, sort of quite passive on b7. But with the knight on a6, in combination with the bishop on b7, I, there are simply not enough pieces on the king side to create serious threats. So e4, just stopping any e4s. f4, here for instance, knight a4 is very, very uh, tempting. He has to go c5. But Nepo needing, I mean, basically... It was not clear by this point that he needed only a draw, but uh, it was likely, let's say, that uh, that a draw would be fine. So he plays in a very solid fashion, especially the next move here, I think. Uh, if he was really playing harder for the win, then he would take with the h-pawn. Uh, maybe get f4 someday, but also just continuing with c5. Instead, he takes with f, trying to keep the structure symmetrical and, uh, uh, and sort of eliminating any, any risk of losing, at least. Although he was well aware that it decreases his advantage. So c5 uh, was tried, which was a very good move because, well, you have to do something about these, these two pieces as, as black. And c5 will help at least one of them. So if white takes, then uh, b you can take and later play c5 and the bishop could come to alive. Uh, and uh, in the game, white took on c5. And now at least the knight is uh, more uh, uh, more active than before. Here, MVL, who is one of the guys in the top who cares the least about material, decides to sacrifice the pawn on, on b6, uh, which is uh, an interesting choice. Although b takes e5 would also be quite logical in order to place the knight on b4. Uh, probably... In, let's say, the terms of playing for a win, it would make a little bit more sense because 
would keep more materials. Whereas, whereas after knight takes c5, rook takes b6. Yes, the blockade is very nice. The compensation is uh, okay. It's very hard for white to make progress. Uh, but you are not really playing for more than than just uh, keeping keeping the position as black and uh, sort of making a draw. Uh, so here, uh, I think a little bit more active was the move rook f8, uh, and the point is that after white stops the infiltration of the queen, then you go back. Now, rook takes f8, queen takes b6 would actually be quite unpleasant due to the tactical tricks along the diagonal. Uh, and if white, for instance, goes uh, back with the rook, then after, let's say, rook takes f1, rook takes f1, queen a5, MVL is at least more active than, uh, than in the game. White does not have the two active rooks. Uh, and uh, well, uh, white is still very solid, and it's unlikely that anything would happen to him. But there is more uh, more play for black than in the game. So queen d8. I mean, it's a cute trick if you take the knight and queen c7 traps the rook. But after white, uh, uh, sorry, here is here uh, takes queen c7, traps the rook. Same same plan. Uh, but if white instead plays rook db1 as he did in the game, then uh, white is simply too active, and in the game. MVL actually did not find anything better than uh, trading the rooks on the b-file and after the trade it was possible also to trade the queens and this ending. The knight on c5 actually gives enough uh, of a blockade uh, in order for black to have basically a fortress but uh, Nepo was, did not mind too much because by this point Grishuk had already uh, gotten a winning position and the rest of the moves I mean, it would be a draw anyway uh, with the with the fortress, but uh, Nepo did not even try and just repeated moves. So, uh, actually, secured him the victory in the candidates tournament. So, I mean, very very well done to him. The first part, but especially the second part now uh, was a very very convincing performance. He beat the guys out of shape, held easily against the other ones, and uh, I mean, very well deserved. Uh, victory for sure. Oh, of course, when you win with the one round remaining, it's always very well deserved. Uh, there were two other games, not so important for the for the final uh, battle, but still, uh, let's have a quick look. So, Fabi, uh, Bang Hao against Fabi, Fabiana Caruana, C5. I mean, he's still trying to create winning chances, of course. There was a theoretical chance that if Nepo lost both games and Fabi won both games, they would tie, but... Uh, so he, he sort of tries, but... Wang Hao, I think he... It looked to me like he had uh, enough of the tournament already. Uh, explains his next move, C3, which... Can be played for the win, but it's also a very logical choice if you're trying to be uh, very solid. So, there are many, many lines for both. But what Wang Hao does is no nonsense, it's just... Developing towards the center, and when the time came, uh, specifically after bishop d7, he decided to take the knight on d5 before the bishop comes to c6 and can recapture. After e takes d5, knight c3, what will happen is that these two pawns will disappear and the position will be quite symmetrical. Uh, so, something like this. Here, I think previously, I mean, in the old days, you would think that white was a bit better because the bishop on e6 is blocked in by the own pawn, but practice has shown that these positions are uh, completely fine for black. You just uh, basically put the rooks on the open files and this f6 move is uh, is key. Bishop is controlling one color, the pawn is controlling the other, and there is no squares for white to enter at any part of the board. The only one would be c5, but it's very easy to play b6. Again, opposite side of the bishop. So Wang Hao play, plays a bit uh, sort of, uh, uh, let's say, without a clear plan. I think he's basically, uh, to a large extent, trying to trade. Uh, well, knight going to e3 is, is nice because it's a dark square, pr putting pressure on, on uh, d5, but the problem is that it looks nice, but there is nothing to do. So he, for here, for instance, he starts to go back. Uh, and now, I mean, Fabi is clearly improving a little bit on each move, and Wang Hao is going back and forth, so... This is something I like with Fabi, though, that he... 
in such a situation, he would not repeat. I mean, I know a lot of players who would uh, just repeat moves. And just, okay, there are no more chances. Let's, uh, let's go home. But he actually plays for the win. So this h5, h4 creates some tension on the king side. Now knight a5 to c4 is coming. And there is some uh, some potential for play. I mean, at least there is no reason to make a draw yet. And Wang Hao is getting impatient. This is very typical when you sort of repeat. The opponent does not repeat. You don't really know what how to react. And uh, you uh, get a bit impatient, which is what happened. Because this position, I mean, it's still very solid for white. But at least the d-pawn is slightly vulnerable. And maybe the bishop can become strong. So... At least now it's possible to envision a scenario in which black wins, which is what happened. I mean, Wang Hao basically still tries to trade. Uh, and on move 34, he decides. I don't know if maybe he suddenly changed his mind because... Or he was just scared that, for instance, bishop g6, bishop d3 would come and he would be able to do nothing in the meantime. Uh, a little bit unclear to me the reason, but he does play d5, uh, which is putting the pawn on the same color as the bishop, so a pawn gets a little bit weaker, but he does get some activity maybe with the queen d4. Uh, also, he prepares to move rook e1, because the pawn otherwise would be hanging on, uh, on d4 after the trade. But queen f4, very useful tactical tricks if you take, uh, rook takes an e1, with check, so you win the rook. And when the queen retreated, then bishop c2, uh, again, you cannot take because of the rook, so you have to go to a1, and here, takes, takes. Now it's clear that with, let's say, the white queen active on d4, white would maybe be a bit better, but with black's queen on e5, white's queen on a1, black is calling all the shots here. And here, uh, he finally, on move 40, did not uh, spot the best defense. It was still possible with ugly move f3 to uh, hold on to things. But he played king h1 with a few uh, seconds left, with less than a minute left. And after bishop e4, the pawn is actually just dropping on d5, so uh, because of the pin on the queen. So the queen also cannot protect because then the knight falls, so uh, d6, bishop c6. Now you cannot again protect because of the knight. Uh, and after queen b2, queen takes d6, he just resigned. And, uh, so, I mean, he resigned, uh, some some said quite prematurely yesterday, but this is also equally hopeless. So black is more active, has an extra pawn, has the better bishop against the weaker knight. Also white's king is a bit weak, so... Yeah, it's... I mean, I would not have resigned in a game, but I would have lost it for sure, so... <laughs> I don't think we should uh, criticize him too much. Uh, final game was the game which we will probably go through the quickest. Uh, it was Alexenko against Ding. Alexenko with the Italian, Ding with e5. As usual, first point was this slightly strange looking move b3. The point is that after after the move bishop e6, you are able to take back with the b-pawn on c4. Uh, so strengthening the center, taking towards the center also d4 would now be possible. But Ding played a very sensible move bishop b6 and uh, bishop e6. And the thing here is that... Uh, uh, I mean, white has to be incredibly accurate in order to stop black from just going d5 and uh, getting a very comfortable position. And I'm sure in the prep there was some accurate uh, way to stop d5, but in the game, Alexenko played knight f1, after which d5 was just completely fine for black. And here, uh, uh, yeah, after queen c2, queen f6, it's basically a very comfortable position for black. As white, you would actually prefer to have the pawn back on b2 and even then uh, it would uh, it would be just very equal so uh yeah ding actually i mean he showed his class here that nothing can be can be said about that he made some very logical moves actually alexenka decided to take uh, the pawn on e5 so now it's some sort of martial style position uh with uh, black getting the bishop pair but white having an extra pawn and uh Presumably, it's quite balanced. It's more a matter of taste which color you prefer, uh, but it's difficult uh, to uh, uh, to play, of course, uh, for both colors, but especially for white because uh, black is the one generally uh, generating the initiative here. But for a while, Alexenko was playing well. Uh, I mean, according to the engine, for instance, uh, he was a bit better here. 
Uh, but as I said, uh, the engine is saying one thing, but playing it over the board is uh, a different matter. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know if, if actually Ding also was happy to repeat here, but uh, uh, it could could very well be, and that would be quite logical. But uh, Alexenka, I mean, I should give him some credit, actually, if it was uh, uh, the intention to play on rather than, than repeat. But... It's not not impossible at all that Black was intending to repeat. So he actually does uh, uh, does play for the win, uh, but b5 creates some tension. Queen e2, it's still fine for White, uh, but it's beginning to get a little bit clumsy with the rook and f3, and the Black is uh, making some uh, some progress. On the other hand. Yeah, Ding still uh, still tries to repeat. Alexenko decides to play the move Queen E2 instead of Queen E3, which to me, I mean, he avoids repetition, but it's a little bit uh, unclear to me what the Queen is doing on uh, on E2. But again, fair play to him for playing on. Uh, the only problem was that uh, the H pawn came, and finally, in a very Good position actually. The move bishop e4 was played after a very very long think. And uh, yeah, I mean <laughs> it's it's high. we can see the computer evaluation, but it was very very tricky to uh, uh, to play all of this uh, entirely correct. But on the other hand, we we should mention that if the bishop uh, retreats. Then definitely, I mean, White having picked up the e3 pawn, I mean, the game has then been quite quite a success for for Alexenko. So, uh, uh, I mean, some yeah, like, yes, this position without the advanced a pawn, uh, it's very unlikely that that at least Black will win, even though drawing chances are still still okay. So, Bishop e4 was, I think, a miscalculation by both players, and here it was possible to play uh, Bishop b2. But long tournament and uh, like, uh, uh, I mean, uh, not. Let's say, it's it's very. I mean, it's it's much less likely that you would blunder like this with. Uh, uh, I mean, being a start, being at the start of the tournament, let's say, like in round two or three. But having lost a couple of games, it's a long tournament. You're beginning to drift a little bit. Probably he missed, bishop e four. Yeah, it, it can happen, and uh, bishop b4, bishop c5 was played, uh, rook b8, and it turns out that uh, it's very hard to uh, to stop the the threats. Threat, for instance, is uh, to go rook b1, checkmate, and after bishop b4, it's possible just to uh, to take it. I think one of the main uh, Things here is uh, if rook d1, if I under, if I recall correctly, it's the move rook b1. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, you simply cannot hold on to uh, to the d1 rook in a good way, because queen d3 or queen f3 you would take, and queen d2 you would play bishop f4, and the queen now cannot really protect the rook on on d1. So uh, yeah, that was definitely in the intention. And instead, after bishop b4, yeah, this ending is just. Uh, uh, lost because the king is very weak and after the check bishop d4 f2 is dropping and then the knight on g1 is Not possible to hold on to forever. So he gave a couple of checks trying to uh, Give perpetual but there is basically almost never a perpetual here. The checks will run out for instance queen e5 king a6 and uh, The ending is uh, just uh, dead lost after queen e2 takes takes and the king is boxed in, can never get out, and the c-pawn easily decides the game. So, uh, went a little bit faster through that game. Frankly, not the most uh, important for the tournament standings, but uh, still decided it was reasonable to show. So, those were the games. Uh, final round tomorrow will be a little bit strange because uh, the tournament is already decided. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the players will be able to play, play a bit freely. Uh, my guess... Uh, is that we will we will see some uh, some solid games as well tomorrow let's say uh, but let's see then and uh, this has been Nils Frandelius Felicius thank you very much